this is the unspoken problem. And I have to say, uh, Sickening was published a little over a year ago, and it's been stunning how the mainstream press won't talk about this issue. I mean, this is an issue that's taking 50% more lives than COVID did at its worst, or during the three years that it was at its worst. And there's no coverage of this issue in the news. So what happened? How, how did we get here? How did this transition occur? This is an article from, um, from the journal Science from 1982 that really describes the transition, the pivot in American medicine. And if you remember, 1982 is approximately the time when uh, Americans' longevity started to fall behind the other countries and our costs started to go up. So in 1982, this article titled The Academic Industrial Complex in the uh, Medical Journal Science, or the Journal Science, wrote that grants from the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation are fewer in number and harder to get. So university researchers and the university's academic medical centers themselves had no option but to turn to alternative sources for research support. They needed to do it to meet their budgets, and the researchers needed to do it to use their God-given talent to do medical research and try and uh, make a contribution to society. Prior to this, it wasn't really respectable for uh, professors to have financial ties to, um, to commercial interests. But this is a quote from that article in Science uh, where Barbara Culleton wrote, scientists who 10 years ago, from 1982, who 10 years ago would have snubbed their academic noses at industrial money, now eagerly seek it out. So from being um, kind of a dirty thing to do, to take commercial money because the research ought to be uh, completely unbiased and, and not have any conflicts of interest. Uh, from doing that, taking money from uh, drug companies and devices, uh, not just uh, status within the profession, but status in terms of promotion. And uh, an, rather than being evidence of, um, uh, of a willingness to work with people who are doing this for the purpose of making money instead of making people healthier, most effectively and efficiently, instead of that being a criti 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 criticizable decision, it became a sign of prestige. Along with the grant money drying up from the feds, uh, the Bayh-Dole Act was passed in 1980. Uh, this was, um, you needed more gray, as much gray hair as I have to remember this, but in 1980, Japanese cars were coming in and taking over the US market, and this was revolutionary. We never got Japanese cars. There were a few imported cars, a Jaguar and BMW, uh, but there weren't Japanese cars, but they were high quality and they were inexpensive. And Japanese um, transistor radios and, and uh, semiconductor products uh, uh, commanded the market. And there was a belief, whether it was true or not, that Japan was the government of Japan was funding an industrial policy. So they were funding the commercial entities and giving them an advantage over uh, other international uh, economies. And the way the United States approached neutralizing Japan's perceived advantage was to pass the Bayh-Dole Act and say, um, th those academic researchers, in particular medical researchers and academic medical centers, who are working with federal money, fund, federal grant money, and develop products that are patentable, and the patents are worth, uh, have economic value, they're allowed to keep that economic value, all of the economic value. They don't have to pay it back. Now, that worked very well to get people motivated to commercialize the discoveries they were making with federal money. But what it did is it changed the function of the university it became, so that now it's standard for universities to be motivated by translational transla translational medicine departments, um, and, and that's a matter of status. And what translational medicine is, it means translating science into money. Doesn't mean translating it into health. It means translating it into money. And in in the same article uh, from 1982, Barbara Culleton quoted the president of Harvard, Derek Bach 
expressing uh, presciently and precisely spotting how this was going to play out. And let me just read this. In 1981, Derek Bach described universities' reliance on industry funding for research as, quote, causing, causing, quote, an uneasy sense that programs to exploit technological development are likely to confuse the university's central commitment to the pursuit of knowledge. Now, this is huge. It's huge because the universities, nonprofit, they're nonprofit, the universities played a role in society to be the overseer of the integrity and the relevance of knowledge. And suddenly they became in the marketplace. They were in the game. And the departments in academic medical centers, they were trying to get research money and they were trying to make money. And now um, uh, you, the most prestigious universities, Harvard Medical School, they, they brag about their, the um, extent of the translational medicine effort in the overall function of the medical school. That's what medical schools have become. The more prestigious they are, the more they are able to get federal funding, do the research, and turn it into capital and get venture capital and private equity involved in it. And they make a lot of money. But what Angus Deaton, the Nobel laureate economist said is that this is a great way to transfer wealth from the American people up to the wealthy people. But it's not a great way to make the American people healthier and have a better society. So this leaves us with two questions about the knowledge that came under this commercial influence. The first question is, is the new medical knowledge that informs healthcare professionals and policymakers epidemiologically balanced? Is the research being done about the right thing to make Americans as healthy as they can be most effectively and efficiently? And to answer this question, we go to an article that was published this article was published in JAMA in 2015, and it was called The Anatomy of Medical Research. This is a quote from the article. It says that Americans, the United States spends $16 billion annual. This, this data is a little old. The article was published in 2015. But the United States spends $16 billion annually on research directed at new drugs and devices, but only $5 billion aimed at health services research, which examines access to care, the quality and cost of care, and the health and well-being of individuals, communities, and populations. So we're spending 96% of our research money. Uh, we're spending 96% of our research money on new drugs and medical devices, and only 4% of our research money on the population health of Americans. Why the disparity in investment? I think you folks can guess. One major difference, and I would say the primary difference, is that new drugs and devices command favorable prices and their value accrues directly to the firm that invests in them and the people who invest in them. In contrast, service innovations that can reduce morbidity and mortality while also reducing cost but financial returns to innovators may be negligible or even negative. And I, I reviewed a book um, by a professor of political science in, in Yale who described eloquently in the uh, early 1900s how the AMA was so critical of public health measures because it was uh, costing, it, it was decreasing doctors' incomes that cholera uh, to clean up the water supply and get rid of cholera was a tremendous, a tremendous impediment to doctors' salaries. Um, and that's basically what these folks are saying a hundred years later, is that we're we're looking for new medical, the, the medical research, which is where our knowledge comes from. We're looking for new knowledge based on what's going to produce the greatest financial return on investment to the researchers and the, and the commercial entities that sponsor the research and not how we're best going to improve um, Americans' health. So what we get, this is called a homunculus, and this grotesque figure of a human being represents the 
disproportionate um, uh, nerve innervation in the 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 the, uh, the brain representation of these anatomic parts, the sensory uh, part of the brain to these anatomic parts, obviously to help us get food and eat food and be sexual and so forth. But it's a grotesque re representation of a human being. And what I want to show is that how we allocate our research is just as grotesque as this homunculus. Because we, the social, the determinants of health are 20% health, 20% health, of our health is determined by health care. 30% of health behaviors, uh, excuse me, 20% of our health is determined by health care. 30% of our health is determined by health behaviors. 40% of our health is determined by socioeconomic factors and 10% by the physical environment. So what we have in the homunculus of the knowledge that we're producing is that we're, we've got 96% of that knowledge talking about drugs and devices, which address at most 20% of the problem. And we've got 4% of our research addressing this 80% of the problem. It's a complete misallocation of our research funds. And that's the knowledge that doctors read in their medical journals and accept as evidence-based medicine. So the second question, it's the, the knowledge is not epidemiologically based, not proportionally to what we need, but even so, is the scientific evidence derived from clinical trials accurate and reasonably complete? And um, what I'm gonna show you is not so much. Back in 1991, before this, before this graph, this graph starts in 1994, but the graph is um, the percentage of the proportion of um, commercially sponsored, uh, the percentage of research that is done by commercial entities or in academic settings from 94 to 2004. And 91 is not a data point that was included in this graph, but in 91, 80% of research was done in academic medical centers and 20% was done by commercial entities, 80% in, in uh, academic medical centers. But by you can see by 2004, the 80% of research that was had been done in academic medical centers went down to 26%. And the drug companies and device companies took over control of the rest of that research. This is where things really changed. Drummond Rennie was uh, the uh, associate uh, editor or deputy editor of JAMA in 1999, I think. And as the proportion of research that was being done in academic medical centers was going down, he wrote in 99 that this was creating a race to the ethical bottom for research funds. And what he meant by that is as the universities, academic medical centers got less and less money to do their research when it was siphoned off and given to private uh, contract research organizations, the academic medical centers had to agree to the same terms that the uh, contract research organizations were willing to work on uh, the, the same terms uh, or they wouldn't get any money at all. Drummond Rennie said, this is a race to the ethical bottom. Let me show you the consequences. This is an article. The next slide is from an article that was done that looked at the research contracts between drug companies and universities in 2004 and what the terms of those research contracts were that caused Drummond Rennie to say it was a race to the ethical bottom. So the, this article was done by surveying the contracting offices in academic medical centers and asking them the terms that they would accept in a research contract with a drug company. And uh, one question was, uh, in your best judgment, would you allow a clause in a multi-center clinical research trial agreement saying that the sponsor will own the data produced by the research? Own the data. 80% of the contracts that academic medical centers signed with 
drug and device companies allowed the sponsor of the research, the commercial sponsor of the research to own that data. Mm -hmm.